Paradise Beach, once known for its golden sand and clear waters, has become a dead zone with millions of rotting fish. Nobody in their lifetime, we as the elderly people, nobody saw it. And they believe in these uh, supernatural things. So they say that's it's why. It's a bad omen. Yeah, bad omen, exactly. Crabs, fish, everything was completely dead. Wow. Even all the plants surrounding that place are all down. Turn red. They all died. And the water, they have no living thing in that water. Then. Locals have been quick to link these apocalyptic scenes to the Chinese factories now dotting these shores. These fish meal plants promise employment, infrastructure, and a potential solution to a global food supply crisis. But at what cost? Two thirds of the planet is covered by water. It's our planet's wildest frontier, breathtaking as much as it is vital to all life. A place of discovery and endless reinvention, a metaphor for freedom, as well as a profoundly dystopian realm where the darkest of all humanities play out. Over 50 million people work at sea, and human rights and environmental abuses often occur with impunity. Six, of you. Six people we are sleeping in here. So hot. This is, un I've never ever seen this bad. My name is Ian Urbina. As a journalist, I've spent the past decade reporting from this lawless frontier. I run an investigative journalism organization called The Outlaw Ocean Project that reports about crimes happening in this space. This is the Outlaw Ocean. The 5,500 kilometer coastline of West Africa is home to some of the most diverse waters in the world. It's also economically vital to the region. More than seven million people from Mauritania to Liberia rely on fishing for their livelihoods. For centuries, artisanal fishermen worked in tandem with nature's rhythms. Abundant fish maintained healthy local fisheries. Then, industrial fishing by foreigners began. We have to start perhaps in uh, 1880 when uh, the Brits deployed the first uh, steam trawlers and they emptied around the British Isles the stocks of fish that had accumulated over centuries in a decade or so. And they had to fish further offshore. And basically that phenomenon reproduced itself in every country uh, of the world. The biomass, the amount of fish in the water has declined. We have wiped out 90% of the big fish. And that, that is very hard for people to conceive. With the depletion of at-sea stocks, a hopeful solution emerged, fish farming on land. Aquaculture is often framed as both sustainable and a scalable way to feed the world. But there is a catch. Industry routinely chooses to feed powdered wild fish to their farmed fish in order to fatten them up and sell them faster. Fish meal is a very inefficient food source that actually worsens depletion of ocean fish stocks rather than slowing it. Fish meal is a, a product that you get out of fish that, little fish, they are ground up, they are not treated like fish uh, in, for human consumption, and they are put in grinding machine, and they are then dried uh, in a reduction plant, and then you get powder.
With relentless demand from China pushing fish meal prices to record highs, companies have set their sights on West Africa as a new source of supply. Gambia is the target. Stocks are still relatively robust compared to the rest of the oceans. It's one of the world's poorest nations with the least monitored national waters. My team and I joined local journalist Mustafa Mane, who has spent years investigating the impact of 14 fish meal factories that have popped up in Gambia and neighboring countries. Uh, where are we right now? Uh, we are at uh, Gunju, just close to the Goliath factory. Do you think it's safe for me to try and sneak some shots with this phone? It's risky. It's really risky because you can be attacked. You can be assaulted. Mm -hmm. They are very aggressive because they don't compromise. Mm -hmm. Okay. Should we put the cameras away or the cameras should be put away? Fabio, put the camera down. Not only does the industry create food security issues, but it also destroys local tourism with rancid smelling emissions and pollutes local waters as the factories dump toxic waste. <laughs> A local TV crew filmed images of the process. But what was deeply concerning and not exposed were the levels of chemicals the factory used to turn fish to dust. The effects on the environment were catastrophic. Waters turned red, and the fumes were toxic. The smell is unbearable. Microbiologist Ahmed Manjang analyzed the water and found it contained double the amount of arsenic and 40 times the amount of phosphates and nitrates deemed safe. Locals destroyed a pipe that was pumping waste into the ocean. Activists were arrested, but the pipe was restored. Why do you think they can get away with operating above the law? Because Gambia is in serious political debt with China. Okay. Hello. What's going on? You good? I went to Manjang's home. He's the microbiologist who had tested the toxic waters. He's also now a leader in the opposition to the factories. The local fishermen, they lost control of their beach. These fish meals are taking the protein away from our dinner tables. Mm. So what's that going to happen? We're going to have a malnourished nation. Anyway, we are taking the natural one, giving it to the Chinese. They convert it into powder, send it to China, feed the fish, cheap, and bring it to, to Ghana. And we sell it to, to you Illinois, yeah. at an expensive price. The, the bunga fish we, we see now will disappear, and that will be a disaster for this community. The ocean conservation group Sea Shepherd began to patrol Gambian waters to help the local Coast Guard. I was invited on board. The first time out, we like saw a vessel, didn't know who it was, ran at it, got there, and suddenly it's the vessel that we were most interested in because it's connected to this really sketchy fish meal plant on land. Can you repeat, please? I repeat. I cannot, but we need to keep a hold of the ship. I cannot. Get us down. Possible. Every man possible. Come here. I can sing the possible. This is a vessel that like had its transponder off, so it was already a dark vessel. But even worse, it had no fish log. The fishing vessel's gotta have a navigation log, which is their, their positions every day, where they fished, the quantity of fish. You can see the last entry here was on the 21st of January, and then there is nothing. Then this is a, this is a dark ship. Who knows where they fished? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Santa Maria. He's saying that he's saying that they can't start going to Banjul yet. Yeah. He needs two hours to make some repairs. We've um, seen him motoring all morning. It's, it's, it's a delay tactic so he can get on the radio. The captain of the ship was not particularly cooperative, and the Sea Shepherd crew and the Gambian fishery and navy officers told him he was under arrest and ordered him to bring his ship into port. And then the second vessel was 10 times worse. And there was this space, it was like a crawl space, where all these guys were sleeping at night. So hot. Fabio, this is, un I've never ever seen this bad. Sometimes we close here, but the water still is coming in. Few things rattle me these days. But for some reason, that space really rattled me. The local fishermen here also testify that these guys have been trolling uh, very, very close to the shore. On top of that, the living conditions here are really not for humans. Not even for animals, but not for humans. We saw how rules were broken with impunity to meet government-imposed quotas, but also how these trawlers fished well beyond demand of the fish meal factories, leading to massive discarding of dead fish back into the ocean. The overcatch is left to rot in the waters or on the beaches, like in Gambia. We harvest fish the same way that is similar to using bulldozers to catch rabbits. Uh, and if you use bulldozer to catch rabbit, you, you will have no forest. Our use of aquaculture is ironically accelerating the very problem we set out to solve. Rather than slowing the depletion of fish stocks, aquaculture is speeding it up because of fish meal. And ultimately, it is the poor and our oceans that continue to pay the price for our ferocious appetite. I will run and come back but I will never stay away because I believe one thing that is, if Gambia is destroyed, it's destroyed for us. And if Gambia is made, it's made for us. And I always ask myself one person that is, what is gonna be my answer if my children or my grandchildren happen to ask me, what are you doing mm. when all this environmental distance mm. is happening? I always want to have the answer. And that's the main reason that's why I keep speaking to people. I keep doing what I should do. I keep raising the awareness level of people because awareness raising is key.